Uh, welcome to this evening's book talk with Lord John Brown, Robin Nuttall, and Tommy Stadler on their recent publication, Connect, How Companies Succeed by Engaging Radically with Society. My name is Bruce Usher. I'm a professor at Columbia Business School. I'm co-director of the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise. And our agenda this evening is for each of the three co-authors to take 10 to 15 minutes individually to make some remarks. And then we'll open up to uh, audience Q&A uh, with all three authors together, and then book signing and reception thereafter. I'm going to take two or three minutes before I turn it over to the authors just to make a few comments about the book. The public discourse on the connection between business and society has been based on the idea that business should be attentive to society's needs and that it is the right thing to do. This thinking has underpinned much of the support for corporate social responsibility and the addition of CSR offices in many, if not most, corporate suites today. So I was surprised and I was frankly pleased to read and connect that, quote, CSR is dead, which perhaps a bit harsh. But here's the key point, and again I quote, as traditional sources of competitive advantage are eroded, connection with society represents a final frontier of competitiveness, an opportunity to build lasting distinctiveness, unquote. Couldn't agree more. In 1934, Columbia Business School professors Benjamin Graham and David Dodd wrote a book it's titled Security Analysis, which became the fundamental text on what we now call value investing. The concepts that Graham and Dodd pioneered remain extremely valuable today. But what's changed in the years since they wrote that book, all the way back in 1934, is how companies are valued. Because in 1934, the vast majority of the company's value was in its tangible assets. Today, most value is intangible assets, goodwill, brand, intellectual property, companies, employees. That's where the value really is today. It's my opinion that investors have been slow to catch on to this new paradigm of investing, where much of the value in corporations today is in their intangible assets, which includes the relationship between companies and society. Again, to quote from the book, there is an enormous prize for companies which choose to meet these new demands with respect, authenticity, and openness, making society's needs part of their business model." Unquote. This book, Connect, may be as relevant to investors and business managers of the future as Graham and Dodd's famous book has been to investors of the past. So please join me in welcoming the book's authors of Connect, Lord John Brown, Robin Mello, and Tom Seven. John Brown, and I'm going to start uh, talking about uh, this book. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be at Columbia. I've uh, been here on a whole variety of occasions, although I did actually go to the wrong business school on the West Coast. So, uh, but it's great to be here. Uh, I've been talking about this book uh, over the last uh, few weeks uh, in the United States. Uh, we published it earlier in the UK uh, in the late fall of last year. And it's remarkable how, when you talk about the book, uh, people would actually really want to talk to you about what's really going on in the news. Uh, and there's been plenty in the news to talk about, which uh, pick up many of the themes of the book. Uh, when I appear on the stage, people want to ask me, uh, where's the price of oil going to be next year? I try and avoid uh, all those predictions. I've been avoiding them for the last 45 years. I uh, intend to carry on. Uh, but they've asked about uh, the Panama Papers today. You know, the Panama Papers are a, a very large cache of uh, information which I think has been stolen, but nonetheless uh, is out there and causing huge ripples. Uh, there is uh, Mula Oil. Uh, another one of these entities which apparently has been involved in large-scale illicit payments around the world. There's Valiant uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, there's uh, a food company. 
for the fast food company, Chipotle. Uh, and there, of course, is Volkswagen. Volkswagen uh, appeared uh, in its guise as somewhat a company that uh, has done some bad things with pollution control equipment uh, two weeks after we published our book. And one of the predictions we made in the book was that if you break your connection with society, you, you have 30% of your company, 30% of the company's value is at risk. And uh, we were very surprised to find out that uh, when Volkswagen was seen to have apparently uh, deluded its uh, customers by uh, defrauding the, uh, the pollution control tests, their stock price dropped by 30%. So this was quite good because everybody said uh, this book clearly has deep insights because it predicts exactly uh, what happens to one specific stock. It's fortuitous and the range, as you'll find out from uh, Robin Nuttall of uh, McKinsey, it is very big indeed. So what does this book do, other than talk about current affairs, uh, which it really doesn't do, uh, it explores the relationship between uh, business and society. Uh, and this is a, a vexed a problem that's been around a long time. Uh, and it uh, denies people a moment's thought, I think, that business is one of the great engines of human progress. It's capable of bringing health and well-being and happiness to people around the world. But the relationship between business and society has always been very tense. And it's this uh, broken relationship, or this relationship that tries to break itself, which is the topic of this book. And the book is not just about the relationship, it's about what you can do about it, how you can make it better, uh, we think. It's not a prescription, but a debate about the things you might want to think about if you're leading a company. So the current model of uh, uh, managing relationships probably doesn't work. Uh, uh, as Bruce said, over the last uh, 20 to 30 years, uh, most companies have developed a, a very fine uh, professional uh, uh, activity called corporate social responsibility, which is designed to govern their relationship with society. I, I was a very early proponent of CSR myself, and I believe it has done some, some good. But uh, it was an important first step only. And I think it's a, comp it's a step that's now out of date. It certainly made companies look beyond simply maximizing shared value. Uh, and companies began to recognize that and report and address their relationship with wi the wider society, including environment, governments, and regulators. But CSR worked for a time. Uh, but like all things that get into um, a routine, it became a process, uh, and it became increasingly ineffective because it became detached from a company's core strategic purpose. People did an awful lot of things under the umbrella of corporate social responsibility, which if taken and not identified with the company, would have a hard time understanding why the company that did this actually did these things. So very much detached from the company's corporate commercial activity. And indeed it became ignored by uh, the leaders of companies. Ignored, that's to say, it was happily left in the hands of a few people. Uh, and as one of my very good friends, uh, Howard Davis, uh, who now runs uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, he, he said <coughs> the thing about corporate social responsibility in his view was that it was something boards of directors attended to for 30 minutes at 4.30 on Friday afternoon. Uh, and that, I think, summarizes the state of affairs. So we, uh, we think uh, that CSR is dead, and if it's not dead, it should be killed. Uh, and indeed, it has actually prevented a lot of companies from, break, from doing the, the right thing. Uh, one of um, the great winners of corporate social responsibility 
awards was Enron. And they won all these huge awards for CSR activity while they were actually defrauding shareholders. Uh, Volkswagen won many awards for sustainability in the same month as their scandal broke. So I think it seems to me that these are very good reasons for change. Now, business has had a very checkered uh, relationship with society uh, in the past. When we researched uh, Connect, we decided we'd look at history and see if there was something that could be learned from history. Uh, and if we can deny, if we can prove uh, the German philosopher Hegel wrong, who said that if there's one thing we learn from history, is that we don't learn from history. Uh, actually, there's a richness of uh, activity in history, which shows that things do repeat themselves uh, over time. They really do. Uh, I think the first one we detected was uh, going back to look at. Uh, some notes made by the great sinologist Joseph Needham uh, about a debate uh, about uh, the purpose of merchants uh, in a hundred years before the common era in China. If in doubt, I think always go back to China to see what's happened uh, and what you can learn from uh, in today's context. Simply, the merchants had their own purpose. They wanted to make money. Uh, they did it by tearing down the forests, burning the wood, smelting, uh, or salt, displacing uh, villagers, uh, and despoiling the environment. Uh, so they thought this was a good thing to do, uh, except nobody agreed with them. And as a result, uh, both sides of the debate about whether merchants were good or bad, both agreed with each other and said they were bad, and it made them uh, the lowest rank in society. So this, I think, repeats itself again and again, whether it is uh, uh, the FDA trying to get rid of bad practices in the meatpacking districts uh, and uh, horse meat scandals uh, 100 plus years later uh, in Europe, or whether it's uh, the, these things just repeat again and again. So the challenges for, the, for companies now, I think, are even more difficult in engaging uh, with society successfully. When a company does something or something happens, it's very clear because the world is interconnected uh, that uh, everything is known very quickly. Many people can comment on what business does, how it does it, why it's doing it wrong, and what should be done. And when I joined industry, people were uh, in, in reverence of uh, authority. I think I can't think of anything uh, that people revere now uh, which is called authority, quite the reverse. Uh, they look to see how they can improve debate uh, with, uh, with leaders. People, I think, uh, see things happening very quickly and very clearly. Uh, in the book I talk about my old company, BP, uh, and the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, the so-called Macondo incident. Uh, I was, I happened to be in, uh, I, I was no longer with BP, but I happened to be in the US, uh, and a few days after that happened, and I could see, uh, as I was checking to a hotel, on four screens, uh, the, 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 the company itself, pouring into the Gulf of Mexico, just as the oil was pouring into the Gulf of Mexico. And you could see it happening in, in front of you every second of the day. It's when you live uh, a, a, a corporate experience like that, it does demonstrate that transparency, which is very important, has changed the role of companies and their engagement with society. So future success, I think, of companies does depend on their ability to engage with society and to do so radically. So research for, by McKinsey showed that the value at stake was 30%, and I think I've talked about Volkswagen uh, already. 
Our research also showed that CEOs now spend 30% of their time addressing engagement, but less than 30% think they do it well and effectively. So clearly something has to change. And radical engagement is uh, the solution that we propose. And I'm going to take you through it step by step. For us, radical engagement basically means we're not condescending, not patronizing society as a whole, but actually thinking about what it is they want to engage with you on, what are their problems, and how are they solved by your purpose and your actions as a company. After all, companies are here to serve society, and they very often forget that. So, we talk in our book about four things that CEOs might want to think about. It's not a recipe. First is to take a dynamic view of the world and think through the effects of their business activity on all their stakeholders. Not just the supply chain, not just the marketing strategy, not just uh, people uh, around, uh, people inside the company, but all their stakeholders. Secondly, they need to think about what they're doing for society, defining their purpose vis-a-vis uh, -vis their contribution to society. Some companies are doing that very well. Unilever have created, for example, a very great reputation in doing just that under the leadership of Paul Pollard. Thirdly, uh, when writing strategy and looking at performance, you need to embed the the impact of your activities and the responses that other people give you to those activities uh, in every aspect of business strategy. So think about what the strategy is with the local community, what it is with the environment, what it is with a regulator. And finally, uh, we say we should really engage radically with society on society's terms and on their own terms. And there are plenty of examples of that. I'll give you a couple of my own experience. Uh, the first was uh, in the mid-90s, I concluded that one of the things that oil and gas companies had to do uh, was to engage on solutions to climate change. What they were doing appeared to risk the world's climate. And so to engage on that matter, one had to say, let's talk about just that issue, not simply to deny it or not engage. Because if you don't engage with people, why would they want to talk to you about your problems? Why would they want to engage you in solutions? But actually to engage on the question of creating solutions to the balance between using hydrocarbons and effects on the world's climate. So that, at the time, was surprising. It uh, certainly included plenty of people, regulators, NGOs, the staff. It included all these people. But it did not include much of the oil industry who decided to stand apart from it. And many are still standing apart from uh, the, that particular engagement at the moment. Another thing I, I found very difficult to do uh, was to take uh, BP, much like any resource company, into different areas of the world where a trust had been broken. And we uh, uh, had found ourselves in possession of a very large gas field in a, in a part of Indonesia uh, called Papua, West Papua. Uh, very backward society society which was uh, very badly treated by the army and the police, uh, huge human rights problems, people disappeared overnight for no apparent reason, people were killed for no apparent reason, uh, and uh, trust was broken. Secondly, the environment was wrecked, people came and dug up uh, trees and put in palm, palm trees instead of palm oil, overfished the bay, uh, and as a result, uh, the amount of uh, resources available for the villagers, of which there were several villages, uh, was reduced. And they, in turn, were at loggerheads with each other. 
Meanwhile, we found this gas field under one of the villages. The first proposal made to me was it would be a good idea if we moved the village because we couldn't move the gas field. I thought that was a really bad idea. It seemed to me that would not build trust. Uh, it would only destroy trust. Uh, and so we concluded we had to find solutions. How do we get people to work? How do we get the community engaged to work on human rights? How can we figure out where to put our gas plant uh, and make sense of the villages and their employment? Uh, the problem was too big uh, for one company. Uh, and in particular, it was very big if you believe that the solution had to be trusted by everybody affected. So we, we realized there was one very important thing to do. In the matter of trust, find a trusted person and get them to do something for you. So we set up a commission, uh, which uh, was independent of BP, funded quite separately. And we asked uh, Senator George Mitchell to come and run it. And he had one remit, which was to look to see what we were doing and tell us what was right and wrong. And he was empowered to write reports and publish them without first checking with BP. And that was very important. It wasn't, it didn't go down well internally to start with, uh, but it really did go down very well after a couple of years with people in the outside world. It's another form of radical engagement. Radical engagement through having independent assessment, independent trusted voices. So what does all that mean? I think when I look at uh, this book and the book I uh, published uh, previous to this one called The Glass Closet about uh, how, you, how you can engage uh, with LGBT uh, issues and people inside companies, uh, I concluded that the thing that really mattered to leaders uh, was to get inclusion right. Inclusion of people inside a company, inclusion of people outside a company, inclusion on their terms. Because inclusion uh, takes down the barriers, increases trust, and allows everyone to be engaged. And one of the things the studies always show, we've got some very recent ones, is this, that engaged companies do better than those who are not engaged, internally and externally. And actually, uh, in the end, they make much higher returns and therefore higher profits on a sustainable basis. That, and, that's, uh, uh, and, that, and our estimate is that's about 20% higher than competitors over a decade. And this is not theoretical. I think if you look at a company like Salesforce.com or Google before they ran into some tax issues, uh, these were companies that greatly engaged uh, with society and actually did produce some extraordinary returns as a result on a sustainable basis. Enough from me, let me talk, hand over to Robin now uh, to talk about uh, different aspects of the book. Robin. I'm Robin Nuttall from McKinsey, and because I'm from McKinsey, I have to present some PowerPoint slides. <laughs> Otherwise, I won't get to sleep tonight, uh, despite a long flight from London yesterday. So my apologies, but it will be only five or six, maybe seven slides. I'll try and control myself. As John, John outlined, um, we have the 30-30-30 phenomenon. And what we essentially found is that 30% of a company's values at stake from external decision-making, regulators, governments, uh, reputation considerations, and so on. That CEOs are spending 30% of their time, roughly, on these external engagement issues. When you add all up and you do the diary analysis, it's around about 30% of, of a CEO's time. So it's a massively absorbing topic for them. However, less than 30% of CEOs feel that they're being successful in this domain at all. 
Um, so what does this imply in terms of a compass you know, for, uh, for our uh, chief executives? Well, the, the starting point is just to dig into a little bit of the, um, of the research into the value of stake. And it starts with financial value of stake. So we've looked through each of the sectors and we've estimated the share of EBITDA, which is at stake from external decisions. So you can take the classic heavy regulated industries, telecoms, media, utilities, here you have stroke of the pen risk. A regulator can increase your rates by 30%, reduce them by 30%, change your interconnection, change your tariffs, change the framework of the innovation, and that has an immediate impact on the value of the company. But it's not only the heavy utilities. Let's take consumer goods, food and beverage companies. Um, 20 years ago, they wouldn't have considered themselves to be heavily regulated. Now you have sugar taxes, you have fat taxes, um, they're very much in the line uh, of inquiry from, from governments. Resource companies, they need land access rights to grow. Just a very fundamental, uh, a very fundamental uh, mechanism for them. And then finally, think about tech and the issues of privacy, data, Apple versus FBI um, is a recent case. Uh, what, what you see here is, is, is that there is you know, large value at stake. But um, it's not only downside. This is not just a downside risk mitigation exercise that we're talking about in the Connect book. It's also upside, because if you are to the right-hand side of here and able to engage with regulators and, and governments, then you can achieve superior innovation frameworks. Um, you can achieve uh, superior uh, access to land rights. And you can achieve you know, a consumer premium and a brand as well. So this is upside as much as there's downside. So financial value was, was the first starting point. But it's also social value. So what is the value to society? So McKinsey Global Institute documented what are the 10 biggest social burdens on the planet. These are the biggest problems on the planet by far. They are colossal problems. Obesity number three impacts 2 billion people globally, causes 5% of global deaths. There's now more obese people than there are underweight and underfed uh, people on the planet. But what's striking when you look down these uh, topics is a couple of things. Number one, they're all chronic. If we're looking at this chart 10 years from today, unfortunately, one prediction that we would make is that it's going to look quite similar. You will still see smoking. Smoking is a growth industry because of emerging markets. You'd still see number two, quite probably, unfortunately, alcoholism, illiteracy, climate change, outdoor air pollution. These are chronic big topics, but they're also areas where government and business need to interact to address these issues. We don't believe that any of these issues can be addressed either by government on their own or business on their own. John highlighted climate change. The matter, without innovation um, in clean tech, climate change um, will remain a, a persistent problem. But without the right rules of the game set by the government, all those investments are not going to be made. So this is entirely synergistic. And it's a huge opportunity for corporates, essentially, who can look at this list and say, I have a value proposition to help solve this problem. What's the x-axis? Excuse me. Yeah. The x-axis is uh, disability adjusted life years, which is a measure of um, impact on a life year of a human being. Um, so smoking is, uh, we estimate, reduces um, disability adjusted life years by 2.1 billion globally every year. It's a measure of, of harm if you will, which is used by the World Health Organization, for example, as a sort of single, it's the single metric of public health, you know, either in a positive sense or in this case, as in a negative sense. Now, as, as John said, we, we believe that there's actually real things that CEOs can do um, and real opportunities here. And the four steps that, that John went through, or what would you go, I'm just going to say a couple of brief words about the research on. Map your world, define your contribution, apply world-class management, and engage radically. Map your world, despite the massive value at stake that we've set out um, uh, in the previous exhibits, um, it's, this is not something where customers, where 
the companies feel that they're being at all successful. Very few companies even seek to quantify the value at stake, either qualitatively or, uh, or quantitatively. And we also say here that what's important is to distinguish the immutable trends from the fads. 15 years ago, Nestle and Danone realized that health and provenance was a long-term immutable trend. And they tilted their portfolios and their marketing um, and their products much more towards pro-health. And they achieved a premium, in our view, relative to, for example, uh, sparkling beverage. So what is the immutable trend that's impacted my industry versus a passing fad? In the case of health, protein was a passing fad, but concerns about provenance, probiotics, and so on have proved to be uh, very enduring. John mentioned the, the Unilever example. That they have a twin objective function. One is to double the revenue of the company. That is a financial objective, to double the revenue of the company. But the second is to improve the health and hygiene of a billion people. And that is measured by a third party. It's on the website. There's nine different measures of it, from water and sanitation you know, through to basic health and hygiene, um, through to uh, taking sugar out of uh, ice cream products and so on. Um, which essentially is what we call applied world-class management. Those metrics, those social metrics, appear in the scorecards of the business unit CEOs. Otherwise, this, this becomes the theoretical CSR construct, which Professor Usher um, called out right at the beginning, and it's not embedded in the, in the heart of the business. Despite that, there's still very low embedding of these kind of social considerations in the, in the business. Only 30% feel they have the talent, 27% feel they have the processes, 21% feel they have the skills, 16% quantify financial and social impact. So this is a huge gap at the moment. And therefore, companies that can, uh, that can undertake these activities sees a new source of competitive advantage. As Professor Usher said at the beginning, we see this um, as something on a par with innovation, intellectual property development in terms of a source of competitive advantage to win in the marketplace. And then finally, 22% of companies uh, avoid external engagement as much as possible, um, but of the successful companies we looked at, 79% proactively and regularly engage externally. Companies want to engage externally credibly, but they're really struggling to do this. Um, so we pull those four tenets together, and this to us is the new source of advantage um, which we're really excited about, and a lot of our clients and, and companies that we're now working with are really excited about. I'm now going to hand over to Tommy, who's going to talk about the difficult bit, which is the future. Thanks very much, Robin. Uh, my name is Tommy Stadlin. I'm the third, and you may be relieved to hear, final co-author uh, tonight of Connect, and I'm a technology entrepreneur. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the future. Uh, John and Robin have outlined this huge pool of value that is at stake. 30% um, of a company's earnings. So this huge uh, pool of value that is at stake, and the inability of many companies around the world to access that and to compete properly for that pool. So we see this as the final frontier of competitive advantage now. But what we also see is that over the next five to 10 years, this issue will become increasingly a determining factor in a business's success, and also in the success of individual executives as they try to lead companies. And I'm gonna talk over the next five minutes about three deep underlying trends that I think will increase the importance of connecting with society even more than we already see. The first is the impact of very disruptive technologies on the relationship between business and society. The second is the emergence of uh, emerging market companies and countries as new arenas of engagement for this relationship and sometimes battle between business and society. And then finally, uh, I'm gonna talk about the emergence of probably the most demanding global population in the history of the world and what that, what that will do to all of this. So on technology, technology can be an amazing tool for business to deal with society's most pressing concerns without having to fundamentally change their business model. So here we've looked a lot at people like Pepsi and Coca-Cola who use food tech to try and deal with the obesity issue. And they pour a lot of money into that uh, process 
so that they can still sell Coca-Cola or Pepsi uh, at the same price to the same people without having to really, really change anything too difficult. So technology can be a silver bullet. We've seen it in energy with the shale gas revolution as well. It can really, really help to deal with people's needs. But on the flip side, technology is also an incredibly powerful force for transparency. So the, the emergence of the mobile era and the fact that there are going to be 50 billion connected devices by the end of this decade means that there has been never a time when people around the world can hold business to account, can shine a light and be an amplifier of good behavior but also of bad behavior. So technology helps people to uh, deal with business and, and hold it to account. But I think even more interestingly, uh, technology, uh, people fear technology. People fear the, the leverage to do harm that technology in the hands of business can sometimes have. And what we've seen, I think, interestingly recently, especially in the tech sector, is companies deciding that they now have to address people's concerns about technology. And Robin mentioned uh, the, the Apple case, Apple versus FBI. I think in the wake of the Snowden affair, you saw Apple and Google suddenly realize that they now have to address privacy, they have to address the fears of artificial intelligence, of online abuse, and they can't uh, no longer just ride the wave of this great internet age, they have to deal with the dark underbelly as well. So that I think is gonna be a big issue. Uh, we've looked uh, at one company in particular, which is Uber. Uber has a $62 billion valuation. And much of that valuation is predicated on its ability to go city by city. This is in France. Go city by city, uh, dealing with very sensitive and very localized political issues all across the world. So one month they'll be in Paris dealing with something like this. The next month they'll be in Sao Paulo. And that requires really detailed knowledge of local stakeholders and world-class management, people who actually know how to negotiate, know how to deal with local councillors. So they started to take a step in the right direction. They brought in David Plough from the Obama campaign in 2008, and he's now their sort of engagement guru. They brought in Rachel Westone from Google to do the same thing. So they're trying to do this, and their valuation depends on it. Airbnb is in the same situation. It's fighting entrenched industries. It's fighting rules and regulations which are simply not designed to deal with uh, their business model. So we think this will be very, very important. They have to, companies have to address the fear of technology. This, the second theme is this idea of new theaters of engagement. The emerging market share of the world's biggest 500 companies was 5% in the year 2000. That will grow to almost 50% in 2020. So you're getting very large, very new big companies from emerging markets, and they are gonna to have to connect with society. And what we've seen is that these companies have to win trust at home, and they have to do all of the things we've talked about with John and Robin about online, they have to connect properly at home. But interestingly, they have to connect abroad as well. And if you are a company headquartered in India or China, fairly or unfairly, you will be trusted on average by about a third of the people around the world. 33% will trust you on average. If you are headquartered in Western Europe, you'll be trusted by about 75% of people around the world. And for those companies, the, one that, the ones that can close that trust gap from 33% to 75%, they are the ones who are going to achieve competitive advantage. If you think about a Chinese consumer goods company coming to the US, they have to gain that trust. So we think this will be really interesting. It's no longer just about uh, Western companies going to uh, emerging markets and behaving more responsibly. That's important too. But it's about the other way too. So that's the second thing. And then the third trend is, I think, a combination of the first two. It's a combination of new technology and new geography. And as we see this generation, the new generation, which has more access to information than any other generation in history, uh, more money, more wealth, uh, and more education, there is an incredible ability of people to hold business to account, and they will simply expect more from business. That chart Robin showed of the great social burdens of our ages, people are going to expect business to deal with that. And I think it will be the companies that engage on society's terms radically, openly, honestly, uh, who will thrive. And the people who don't do that, the companies, the executives, I think won't survive a business over the next five to ten years. That's enough from us. We'd love to turn it over to some questions. Thanks very much for having us here. So, so ladies and gentlemen, we don't want to be a politburo here. So, uh, uh, some questions or comments from anybody, we're more than happy to 
people just take statements or talk to each other? Yes. yes. Um, um, if you were back at the helm of BP today, could you name a few specific things you would do uh, aside from abolish the CSR um, to engage and connect with the community? So it, to me, the single most important thing is consistency. You know, when established in a pattern of engagement, you have to keep engaging the relevant constituencies to your business on business things. So communities want community engagement. They don't necessarily want something which is abstract uh, and away in a different city. So I think it is uh, reinforcing this point that it has to be in the hands of the respected people who run business locally. There needs to be some, obviously, some rules, but basically, in the end, you're trusting uh, in any company a visible face of the woman <coughs> who is there doing the business. And they have to be there doing business as opposed to advising people on how to do business. They actually have to be the business people. If you have to see delivery as a result of that, they can't always be referring to higher authority. So, to my mind, is it's always distributing this activity uh, to as close as possible to where the business is being conducted. Uh, I know that modern management trends uh, still look for efficiencies in global functional activity. I've always questioned this because uh, it's very difficult to measure in reality. And secondly, the detachment from the actual activity to a theoretical uh, perfection. Uh, I think that gap, you, you, you can't bridge. So I, I think I, if I were running it, I would still always go back to saying, you know, where's the lowest possible, the smallest possible unit that could actually achieve what I want to achieve and be attached in every aspect of engagement. So I think that there's a lot of companies that go through um, very deep, you know, challenges, um, almost existential challenges. Uh, it, it's not only Volkswagen, you know, Chipotle now, we were just driving, but we're trying to pronounce the name properly by those, so apologies for <laughs> mispronouncing. Um, uh, um, you know, BHP Billiton following the dam collapse in Brazil. These are, these are events which shape the corporate culture to the core. And everybody in the organization begins to say, well, you know, what am I getting up in the morning for? Um, why, why am I going to work? And I think, the, I think the, the starting point is to try and clarify and instill a sense of the purpose of the business. It's what we call the second tenet, you know, to define your contribution. Um, but, you know, what, it, what is our, our real purpose? as a corporation which is going to deliver financial value and social value on an external and, and consistent you know, basis through time. Um, the, 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 the second is to overhaul the, the processes internally uh, which are driving distorted incentives. There are all sorts of distorted incentives within companies today to cut corners to achieve you know, better financial results. Those are usually a function of the compensation and reward systems and career progression decisions um, you know, within, a, within a company. Um, those need to be you know, overhauled and, and revised, you know, as we said in the, in the third tenet. Um, and, and the fourth is, is, is to drive you know, much more extreme transparency. There's now, there's now just, there's, there's no way that you can create a sort of secret corporate culture internally and then you know, externally it sort of leaks out you know, eventually through time. So we, we, we actually think that the, the, the four tenets we've outlined here 
Um, they are things which companies need to do when they're under crisis. And then also they're, com they're things that companies need to do you know, on a systemic basis. And it's essentially when, when companies lose sight of those four tenets is when, is when they lose their way. Just one other thing, there's a great uh, Australian regulator um, who in a wonderfully Australian way gathers his mining uh, companies that he regulates. And he says, if you behave yourself in the past, uh, when a problem happens, I can slap you on the wrist. But if you haven't been behaving yourself in the past, I'm gonna punch you in the face when that crisis happens. And I think there's a lesson there about reputation as a reservoir of goodwill that takes a long time to build up. And if you've built that reservoir up, when the crisis happens, people will eventually forgive you. And I think it's really interesting with uh, Toyota, when, when they had their crisis a couple of years ago, actually they had pretty deep reservoirs of goodwill. People really thought that here's a pretty decent company with a good reputation for quality. And within two years, they were right back to number one uh, and the share price had recovered. The same thing may happen with Volkswagen. They have a, a reputation for German quality and all that stuff, so it could come back. It's about building a reputation over a, a long time. But I, th I think if I may, it's not about managing reputation. I think this is a completely false idea. And this is about managing a company consistently and following, at least debating, the four tenets we've put out on a consistent basis. So when things go wrong, because in my experience they always go wrong, uh, that business is about minimizing the number of times they go wrong, then you can rely on what you've done to take you through to the future. So. Uh, a question. Um, with the businesses that you have consulted with, have you seen um, that they define their social value independently based on what the business priorities are? And also with uh, looking at, uh, I guess this was Robin mentioned this about nine social impact metrics that align with the business priorities of the organization across their scorecard. Um, are, where would we find such information if we were interested? So I think in my experience, and I think I've been on the board of a rather large number of companies and I've run several, uh, I think the most effective thing is just to remember what you're doing, what is your purpose, and align everything with that. Just align it, but <coughs> don't necessarily listen to what people will say to you as, it might be a good idea to go and do something quite different, just because it looks good, or because it gives you personal satisfaction. It has, I think, to be aligned with the business. And I think actually if you test companies, find out what they're doing and when the number of things which are not relevant to the business as that number goes up so I think the quality of the company goes down so I think that's the big test in my mind the metrics the, the, the metrics are the two places you can look one is uh, chapter 7 of the book and you will find copies of the book uh, uh, afterwards uh, on that table uh, over there uh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> special discount um, and the second is, is you can look on the websites of these companies. You look on the websites of a Nestle, of a Danone, of, uh, of a Unilever. It's, it's, all now, it's all now online as part of we, you know, what we call Engage Radically. It's all audited by third parties. Um, so it's, it's, it's all out there. Walmart's another example. You know, um, it, it, it's now, a lot of the companies are using external communication publication as a forcing device internally. It's very powerful internally. You say, well, I've communicated, I'm doing these nine things externally. It's on my website, it, it's audited. Then that's, it's actually a very powerful rallying you know, call um, internally. I, I think one of the most successful examples is the, is the French red wine industry. The French red wine industry 20 years ago saw an opportunity to brand red wine as a pro-health product. And to this day, they have a favorable tax you know, regime in France. They have a very, you know, they have a bonhomious brand in Europe. I don't know what brands like in, in the U.S., but but now everybody associates red wine with, you know, good health, like, you know, low cholesterol, you know, happy living, and that that's something which they've thought about, you know, very purposefully. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, how, how difficult is it to sell this ethos, this philosophy, to shareholders who, understandably, are primarily concerned with the bottom line. 
So I, I think it's getting slightly easier. Uh, it depends uh, uh, who they are and where they are. Uh, basically, I mean, shareholders need to align with the with what a company is doing, the time scales and the investment patterns. <coughs> After all, uh, value is generated by you know, returns and growth, but also the time in which these are experienced. So you need to have time uh, as one of the, the big dimensions. So I think uh, shareholders recognize that things are at risk. If you don't engage well, that actually profits go up if you do, uh, and that you need to attend to it. I think where their patience is tried is when they see very glossy reports about doing this, that, and the other, and then they wonder why the company's doing it. Just why exactly are they, you know, re <coughs> to re 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 so replanting a botanical garden when they're actually in the business of making screws? You know, it's not clear to people. So I think it has to be cogent and coherent. I, th I think people like you know, um, BlackRock, Larry Fink, you know, there's a big push now to get companies to be clearer about their strategies and to be measured against strategy. That's the idea is to push slightly longer term and to see how things align in the minds of the executive, the board, of what they're actually doing. And I, I think that'd be terrific if, if more of that happened. Again, in my experience, you can, if you engage with shareholders uh, and say what you're going to do and give them a coherent strategy and measure against it, they'll come along with you. And you may say, well, I'm going to invest and you know, the returns are going to come out in 15 years' time. And they'll be very happy with it if they really do believe that the returns will actually come out. And they follow up though. Uh, Takeover artists and proxy struggles. Would that complicate uh, the further furtherance of this uh, of your uh, suggested mission? No, I don't think so. I think uh, you know, activist shareholders, uh, takeovers. Uh, again, they all look to exploit uh, value differences, uh, where you know things aren't exactly clear, and uh, the apparent values uh, of the company have been the value of financial values have been dented by you know, a bad performance or miscommunication or just bad strategy. So I think they'll always be around. It's not new. Many people ask me about activists and shareholders and, and I remind them about T. Boone Pickens in, in my own industry a long time ago. Uh, he was doing exactly what plenty of people are doing today. And actually did uh, strengthen the industry by what he was doing. Sorry, let's go. I would like to ask a question about renewable energy. Um, this is actually a two-part question. Part one, what is your view on the outlook of renewable energy in the next one years? And part two, given that outlook, and as you mentioned, the urgency of radical engagement, if you had been running BP at a time, would you have made the same decision to terminate the operations of BP Solar? So uh, when I left BP, the, one of my principal activities was to run the world's largest renewable energy fund. Uh, which, which in the end had an enterprise value of $10 billion, which wasn't bad. Uh, and it also produced a, a, a return in excess of the cost of capital, well in excess of the cost of capital, which, is, which proved, I think, that renewable energy was a business, not just a philosophy. You could actually invest money and make money uh, in a way which made sense. Now, uh, so I think there are plenty of opportunities. Uh, they come and they go uh, because renewable energy uh, started probably on the wrong footing. It started by people wanting to do something which was good for policy. They believed in, and so they said, here's lots of subsidies. A and so people you know, exploited the subsidies. And the big thing about the subsidies were what they, the subsidies were set by policy people, and meanwhile, the technology was being applied by business people who figured out that if you could get the cost of renewable energy going down, and you could keep the subsidies constant, you made bigger and bigger and bigger margins. It's obvious. 
Uh, that did not sit well with politicians and the population generally. So people nowadays have figured out that you know, subsidies are like taxes, they need to relate to profitability, uh, and uh, so it's a much happier situation. Renewable energy is a very small part of the world's uh, energy supply at the moment. It is growing. I believe it will continue to grow. Uh, I think there needs to be massive R&D put into this sector still, and some of that should be state-sponsored globally. Uh, part of the proposals that my colleagues and I in a different format made to the Paris uh, uh, Climate Change Conference was to do just that. Uh, one of my colleagues was someone called David Attenborough, and so we got him to go and see President Obama, uh, and President Obama liked the idea so much that he took it, re renamed it, and said it was his idea, which was very important, because it meant that it actually got done. Uh, and so uh, plenty of people are now adding lots of R&D expenditure to expand it. I think there's plenty to do. Uh, but the transition from fossil fuels is going to take time, which means that research has to be conducted now to do two things in fossil fuels. Number one, to capture carbon and use it as well as store it. There's a big chemical breakthrough to be made there. And secondly, to stop methane leaking into the atmosphere from natural gas production, because that's about 40 to 100 times worse uh, weight uh, than CO2 for climate change. So those are the areas that big research needs to go to as well. But there is a possibility. So most of the companies that you've talked about, Toyota, Volkswagen, Chipotle, Unilever, Google, Apple, do not produce products that are inherently bad. They produce products that, if properly produced, could have a good impact. You talked about Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Those are companies that I believe produce products that are core products that are inherently bad. They, they create diabetes and uh, obesity. How do you deal with those kind of companies? I want to make sure I support effective utilization of resources. <laughs> the first thing is that I would challenge the notion that all sparkling drinks are a you know are a bad product for a start 50 percent of the sparkling drinks portfolio is diet or you know zero calories there is no medical evidence on the negative impacts of aspartame we can take that offline there's been 500 studies of it um, uh, and and the, the other thing which is really interesting in the debate so Mexico has introduced a fat tax, basically, on confectionery and on sparkling beverage. The United Kingdom has just introduced a sugary drinks tax. When you look at the numbers, sugary drinks account for about 80% of the excess calories of an obese person versus a normal weight person. Um, what actually drives a bigger difference in the calories is carbohydrates, so bread, for example, quesadilla, burritos, if you're talking about Mexico. Uh, it's processed meats. And it, my, my great Spanish, you're, you're obviously hearing. Um, it, it's processed meats, it's, you know, it's hamburgers, it's, it's french fries and so on. So when you, have, when you look at the evidence, what, what, what's quite interesting is that it's, a whole, it's, it's actually an integrated diet which determines obesity or not. One single ingredient, and that includes sugar, is a relatively small contributor. Much larger contributors are processed foods um, and bread, you know, candidly. So that, that, when you look at the evidence... bread company? What about well, that, 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 yeah, I, I think so. But again, it, it's it's about it's about how you consume the bread products as part of a diet. To say all bread is is bad, you know, is 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 uh, is, is is wrong. I mean, consuming bread in normal you know quantities is perfectly healthy, perfectly fine. It's an excess consumption of a product which is dangerous, which is then an individual responsibility. And then, and, and then, and then you raise the question: What's the role of the state in effectively, you know, in effectively intervening in individual decisions? Now, the, the key thing, one of the key things about obesity, and one of the things you may be raising, is there's a strong childhood element to it. So, childhood obesity is a huge problem. Twenty-five percent of many urban populations, you know, have childhood obesity. 
and, and that raises much more of a tension in, in the role of you know government versus the individual because it's hard to argue that those children are you know completely uh, responsible for, for their own decisions but at the end of the day either you believe you have a, dem a democratic society where companies are producing um, some products are banned you can't sell heroin at the kiosk that's a democratic decision others you breach a democratic decision to sell those products um, uh, so are they universally bad I, I would challenge that We've got, I think, only a couple of minutes. I'm going to take uh, quick, quick, quick answers. Yes, sir. Uh, hopefully, I'll be uh, It's actually building off of a point you made before about how the uh, CSR or the public publishing will go back and, and incentivize the employee to decide. Uh, forgive me if I get the stats wrong, but Gallup poll came out and there was something like a third of the employees are engaged. About 20% are disengaged, and most of them really don't care. So, do you, so how do you get that 50% engaged? Do you think it's just like what you're saying, or did it have to come internally, like you were saying, of giving more, um, more authority at the, at the? So I think we're both saying the same thing. There are different aspects of uh, leading to get engagement. It's the single most important thing. Come back to saying. To get engagement, you have to get inclusion inside the company, which is to get people really deeply believing, and actually believing, that the purpose of the company is sound and worthwhile for the world, that they have a part of it, and it's reinforced the whole time. And leaders and managers take time with people to actually get them engaged and get them included. And that's really important, whether you're dealing with gender balances, sexuality, religion, race, uh, the difference between technical people and marketing people. It's all these differences. You've got to just keep getting the tension down. And, and I believe that's the way it works. Does high executive pay hinder your ability to engage radically? Yes, it does. Uh, I think no one actually worries about uh, uh, someone who set up a company and built a brand new product and it's been great for the world uh, and then they've made billions. They think everyone applauds that. Uh, I think what they don't applaud is someone who's coming in to be yet another CEO of a company that's been around for 50 years uh, and no one remembers what she or he's done when they leave. Uh, they simply have been there for the ride. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people say, that's wrong. Uh, their pay is simply a function of market increases, uh, or their pay is simply a function of getting some functions uh, ex executed. So I think people uh, generally worry about it uh, because it divides uh, the executives from uh, the people inside the company and from the outside world. So I'm, 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 I'm a great believer in, you know, save for pay and getting a bigger debate going. Uh, I do think, uh, you know, it is certainly true. I remember presiding uh, over, this is a related matter, our, our pension fund inside BP when it was permitted to do that sort of thing. Uh, and we had an advisor who uh, came from a very distinguished investment house. Uh, and uh, we would then have someone coming to measure our returns. And he would look at this man and say, now, very interesting measurements. But tell me, can anyone do anything about that? Does, do, our, do our beneficiaries have the right to leave our pension fund and go elsewhere? It's a bit about competition. Many people are paid on the basis of competitive data, but actually they're not competing. And so it is, uh, I think, this creative a ratchet that maybe most people with common sense don't think it's a very good idea. So. Uh, you mentioned uh, a statistic in the earlier slide that uh, many executive CEOs don't feel that they have the talent to engage in these rounds radically. So I'm wondering what skills do you 
Well, I think, first of all, they, they haven't allocated enough time. That's very important. You know, when people, uh, people always make statements about their agenda, and uh, they're not reflected in their diary. Uh, I think the biggest is human resources are my most important asset. You actually have a look at the diary of uh, a leader, and you don't find that the most important time allocation is against human resources. So the first is being realistic about time. And the second one is actually being trained uh, to think about who affects your strategy, who is part of your strategy, and how do you engage with them? What, what level of engagement? When do you agree with them? When do you disagree with them? When do you cooperate to change? All these different modes of behavior. Again, if you buy our book, you can uh, see all of these different things outlined for you. But it's about education. I think this is going to be the last one. Yes. So you spoke earlier to the purpose of a company as the central thing you must focus on, right? Uh, so, for example, if you are a tobacco company, your purpose is to sell tobacco. Uh, McKinsey Global said that this is a cost of 2.1 billion light years, right? So. If that is your purpose, or for the alternative, if your purpose is to sell hydrocarbons, which costs one billion light years, is your purpose not somehow at conflict with what we think is good for society? Yes, uh, it is. And so you have to recognize that we're in a business which is a transition business. But there has to be some purpose. I and mean, I like to think that hydrocarbons, at least, have created uh, a reduction in the poverty gap in the world. Generally, they've moved people through that poverty gap to an extent. Don't think smoking has done that. Uh, uh, and so I think it's, it's a matter of, I think, looking at the balance of what it is. You know, the fact is that people work in defense industries, they make planes, they make guns, and they make tanks. Uh, there's tremendous demand for those things. Uh, in an ideal world, we don't want them. Uh, but uh, there have been tremendous demand, very high margin stuff. Uh, and uh, people have a lot of activity in that area. But again, the purpose is, uh, is not for society as a whole. And you could argue that it might be to maintain peace, but, but it's uh, something which one hopes the transition will take place and we don't actually need it. And I hope very much, and I said, that there's a transition in my own industry, oil and gas. I think it will take time and it will take uh, clear-eyed uh, understanding of what is possible. The last thing I think we want is for the rich people to be able to afford renewable energy and for people who have no money to have no energy. That's not what it, the, that's not the right answer, I don't think. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think you've been very patient with us. Thank you for listening uh, about our book. Thank you for giving us the questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty more. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we're now going to sign some books and maybe even get you to buy one. Yeah. So thank you for listening.